Hello again, it's your Uncle Scott here with another tutorial for you. This one is going to cover the rather complicated subject matter of the ciliary ganglion. Okay, so we're dealing with some complicated parasympathetics and sympathetics in the orbit. Now to help us do this, I have decided to draw my own little diagram and here it is, I hope you're impressed. Um, we're going to basically draw on a bunch of the nerves reaching the eye and hopefully it will give you a clear idea about where they're coming from and what they're doing and how they get there. Before we do that though, I'm just going to orientate you to this diagram. Hopefully you know that uh, this structure over here is of course the eye and we've got some other structures that need to be named as well. So we've got cranial nerve 5 over here and we've got the mandibular division and the maxillary division. We're interested in this one coming up here which is the ophthalmic division and we know that divides into three. We know that divides into a lacrimal, into a frontal, but we're interested in the one that's going to continue up here and has a role to play in some of the autonomic distribution to the eyeball and that's the nasociliary. So just to complete the nasociliary, let's label some of its branches. So as the nerve continues in this direction, let's just ignore some of the branches coming off in a more anterior position. We're going to come all the way up here. And as described in a previous tutorial, we're going to have ethmoidal branches coming off here, anterior and posterior. And eventually it's going to become a, a terminal branch called the infratrochlear nerve. And that is going to be purely sensory and that's its continuation there. If we come down, change this colour here slightly, we need to acknowledge that there's some nerves coming off here which are going to the eyeball and these are called long ciliary nerves. Okay, And we also have a branch of the nasociliary nerve coming off quite proximally which is going to the ciliary ganglion. So this is the ciliary ciliary ganglion there, this big little ball that's got various branches coming to it and going from it. And this particular root of the nasociliary nerve, this one in here, is called the sensory root because the nasociliary nerve is a sensory nerve. We have a couple of other roots joining it. If we actually look at what else is joining the uh, ciliary ganglion in here, we've got this one which is the sympathetic root. Okay, and we've also got this one which is coming from the ocular motor nerve. So the ocular motor nerve down here. We have this one which is known as the parasympathetic root. So if I can fit that on. Okay, so we have sensory root joining the ciliary ganglion from the nasociliary nerve. We have a sympathetic root that's kind of on its own and we have a parasympathetic root which is coming from the ocular motor nerve which is cranial nerve 3. Now they're all going to in this direction so fibres are travelling in this direction uh, and we have fibres leaving the ciliary ganglion towards the eyeball and they are short ciliary nerves. Okay, so that labels our diagram. So now we need to think about the distribution of these nerves and how they reach the, uh, the eyeball. So we're going to clear away the uh, labelling of this and we're going to begin over again. So let's start off by dealing with purely sensory fibres and in order to do this we're going to make a little key up the top and we're going to say sensory are in red. So sensory up here, it's got an S in it somewhere, which I can't seem to draw on, let's get rid of that, I'll do that again. So sensory is in red, and our sensory fibres are going to of course travel along with the 
cranial nerve 5. I'm drawing in them in the reverse direction, of course, the fibres would actually be bringing sensory information back from the eye, but I'm talking about the distribution. So we're talking about how the nerve actually gets there. So we're going to have a cell body somewhere in here, which is the trigeminal ganglion. And of course, our sensory fibres are going to travel up here and up here and up here. So that's going to be our sensory innovation around the orbit and around the eyelid, etc. But the eyeball itself also needs a sensory innovation. And the way in which sensory nerve fibres can do that is actually travel via these long ciliary nerves down here, say for example, or they can actually pass all the way through the ciliary ganglion and take the root of a short ciliary nerve in order to get to the eyeball. So that's quite simple and that wraps up our sensory innovation to the eye. Now we need to deal with sympathetics, so we're going to change colour and we're going to say that our sympathetics are in blue. So let's write that in black. Sympathetics like that. And so our sympathetics are going to come up the sympathetic route, which is here. And in actual fact, they are going to have come from the internal carotid artery. So I'm going to draw on the internal carotid artery down here. And we can say that our blue fibres have somehow worked as a plexus all the way around and they've come off like this and they've travelled up here and they will travel through the short ciliary nerves to get to the eyeball or they can travel up here and down through the long ciliary nerves to get to the eyeball. So what do we need to know about sympathetic fibres? Well, they are all post-ganglionic fibres. You'll notice there's been no synapses so far. There's been no um, synaptic activity inside the ciliary ganglion. We also noticed that their pathway is variable, so they can travel to the eye via both short ciliary nerves and long ciliary nerves. So the reason why they are all post-ganglionic nerves is because they've all arisen from the superior cervical ganglion in the neck, which is the uppermost part of the sympathetic chain. So the preganglionic fibres will have synapsed in the superior cervical ganglion, so all sympathetic fibres that enter into the head have to be postganglionic. So that's our sympathetics, and of course they will be going to the eye purely to innovate part of the iris and they will be going to the dilator pupillae muscle in order to dilate the pupil. Right, so we now need to deal with our parasympathetics and for parasympathetics we're going to deal with, it, deal with that using green. So para here, so green for that. So these green fibres are going to travel with the ocular motor nerve. And the ocular motor nerve is actually predominantly a motor nerve that goes to most of the extra ocular muscles of the eye. But it also has another nucleus called the edinger westphal nucleus, which generates parasympathetic fibres that travel with those motor fibres. And they travel with the ocular motor nerve up until a variable point, And then they will travel down this parasympathetic route in order to reach the ciliary ganglion. Now because they're parasympathetic fibres and this ciliary ganglion is technically a parasympathetic ganglion because even though sympathetics run through it they don't synapse in it. These parasympathetic fibres are going to synapse. So we need two neurons here. We need a preganglionic neuron and a postganglionic neuron, like that. So let's just label that in a different colour. So this is our preganglionic neuron, and this one here, this arrow is going to the green fibre here, 
this is our post ganglionic neuron. So now you might be wondering what our parasympathetics are doing in the eye. Well their operation is for two things. First of all they go to the sphincter pupillae muscle which constricts the eye, uh, the, lens, uh, the pupil, so it constricts the pupil and it also goes to a structure known as the ciliary body which has suspensory ligaments coming from it that go to the lens and what happens when these muscles contract is that and this is smooth muscle because of course it's innervated by parasympathetics so it contracts and reduces the tension on the suspensory ligaments that shortens and fattens the lens so that we can focus on nearsighted objects and you might be wondering, well, okay, so we've got innovation from sympathetics to a dilator pupillae muscle, and then we've got the opposite response coming from parasympathetics. But going to the ciliary body, we only have parasympathetic innovation. And that's because the nature in which the way the muscle works is that by contracting the muscle, it reduces tension on a suspensory ligament, which is an elastic fiber. So... If we wanted to look at a nearsighted object, we need parasympathetic activation to make that smooth muscle contract and relax the suspensory ligament to fatten the lens. If we then want to look immediately at an object in the distance, all we need to do is reduce the parasympathetic activity and because they are suspensory ligaments, they will go back to their normal um, shape and as the muscle relaxes it will stretch those suspensory ligaments so we do not need a sympathetic innovation to the ciliary body in order for accommodation so that pretty much wraps up the parasympathetics and sympathetics to the eye thanks for watching subscribe to Sultan Brain Hub for more videos to help explain the mysteries of the brain